your last lecture. As most of you know, all six lectures will be lined up here for you to help yourself in case you didn't get copies of some of them. Extra copies have been run out, so I think they're all available now. Today we come to the final and very important item of desulfurization of coal. Control of the coal, or the sulfur content of the coal by some procedure or other. As I pointed out in the notes here, there are really three ways in which one can consider removing sulfur. One is to remove them from the liquid product by hydrogen sulfurization, either at the time of the production of the liquid or later. Second, of course, is to take it out of the gas phase in case one is making a gas. And this removal from a gas phase can be applied to underground gasification. In fact, I put the underground gasification in the title to emphasize this point, that with underground gasification, one has a relatively easy job of removing sulfur because the sulfur is there as H2S in the gas phase. And finally, removing SO2 from flue gas. We'll consider all of these very briefly. And if we have a chance, say a few words also about underground gasification. First of all, in regard to the thermodynamics of sulfur removal, any good catalytic chemist knows that the first thing one has to consider is the thermodynamics of a reaction because much time has been wasted trying to get catalysts which carry out reactions that are not thermodynamically possible. All of the simple sulfur compounds, as illustrated down at the bottom of the page, have very high equilibrium constants going in the direction of hydrogen reacting with the sulfur compounds to form H2S and the corresponding hydrocarbon. And even some of the olefins, of which I give two examples here, will hydrogenate to form the olefin in H2S, still with favorable equilibrium constants. I didn't include the table for thermodynamics of all of the various sulfur compounds because they are available in the literature, part of them in the volume and catalysis, part of them in the, well, at any rate, in the references that are given here. And they all conform to the ones I've used as illustrations in pointing out favorable equilibrium constants up to temperatures of 700 degrees Kelvin or so. Now, typical compounds that are to be removed and typical reactions, I think, are shown on the first slide. Oh, this is one special slide that I put in because the question is often asked, why don't we get rid of hydrogen sulfide and convert it into sulfur by simply heating it up and decomposing it? This is a very intriguing idea and sometimes is proposed. So I just wanted to call your attention to this thermodynamic function for sulfur and hydrogen sulfide. The equilibrium constant, logarithm of the equilibrium constant for the formation of hydrogen sulfide. A large value means now you're not going to get much decomposition. Well, you can see the values here. And even up to the highest temperature shown, 1,000 degrees Kelvin, the equilibrium constant is still 2, meaning that most of the sulfur is going to stay there as H2S and is not going to decompose into hydrogen and sulfur, so that the decomposition is relatively small. And hence, the removal of H2S by decomposing it is not a very profitable procedure. Next slide. This is a group of typical sulfur compounds that are present in coal as given by this paper of Scheut and Gates, which I've mentioned to you before and is one of the very best papers on hydrogen sulfurization. The simple thiols, disulfides, sulfides, thiophenes, and the various derived thiophenes. These, as is well known, become very difficult to remove sulfur, uh, much more so than taking it out of thiophene. And all of this last group in general is quite a difficult group to desulfurize. Next slide. Here is a summary of the reactions for removing these various compounds that I've just mentioned. It's simply the reactions corresponding to the taking out of sulfur, 
including the bicyclic compounds. Next slide. And some of the more complicated compounds, indicating the types of products that can be formed along with the H2S. These, are, as I say, are just typical reactions that are encountered. Next slide. This is a rather interesting slide that Schreit and Gates, am I correct on their name? I think I am. Yes. Schreit and Gates, but I won't pretend that Schreit is the correct pronunciation. It's S C H U I T. If there are any Dutchmen here, you can pronounce it more correctly. Uh, this is a slide illustrating what happens as one changes the loading on the benzothiophene compound here. If the R group is hydrogen, then one simply has a benzothiophene compound, and the product to get, that you get preferentially here is 96%, simply the removal of sulfur from the end. In other words, one gets a bond breaking at this point, the sulfur is clipped off, and these two carbons stay on the surface stay on the compound the product to give a rather clear-cut formation of, of this benzene ring with an ethyl group up here and an R group down here, or well, this is hydrogen, so it'll be just ethyl benzene. If, on the other hand, the R group is CH3, there's a little influence in the direction of tending to clip off one of the carbons as a secondary reaction, or clip off two of them as a tertiary reaction, but not too much change otherwise. When one begins to put methyl groups on the thiophene, one makes radical changes. The principal reaction is probably what you would expect, namely to just knock sulfur out, and then having three carbons in a row get this compound. I think this sulfur is a misprint, because obviously the compound you get is the one without that sulfur. If we're going to talk about a desulfurization reaction. And then one begins to get small quantities of these other reactions. Uh, this one obviously would involve isomerization of these CH3s so that one would get the uh, ISO CH3 group on the side. Coming over still farther and putting the CH3 up on the upper side here gives this as a predominant compound, which is the one that you would expect, uh, and smaller amounts of these other compounds. This one would involve the isomerization and so forth. And finally, putting two methyl groups on, one gets primary products down here consisting of knocking off some of these methyl groups. And this one, one methyl group is knocked off. Uh, here, one methyl group is knocked off. And so forth. Now, this table is not in terms of percentages. It's in terms of peak heights for a particular set of conditions that were carried out. This is worked by Venuto back in 1970. And I think it illustrates the difficult nature of talking about taking sulfur out of compounds until one knows exactly the stoichiometric arrangement of the entire molecule, because substituent groups, substituent groups make quite a considerable difference in the rate and nature of reaction. Next slide. <coughs> this is merely a slide to indicate that all of these hydrogenations we're talking about are very strongly exothermic. You'll notice adult H values are have pretty high negative values, meaning exothermicity, for all of the reactions indicated here. Next slide, please. Now as to catalysts that are used. As I pointed out in the notes, molybdenum, tungsten, oxides or sulfides, the other component, cobalt, nickel, iron, either by themselves or in combination with, with molybdenum and sulfur, are all well-known compounds for hydrodesulfurization. There are a couple of things of interest that I wanted to mention to you in connection with this paper, incidentally. The first of which is that since Schreit is a European, he's very anxious to conform to all of the formalities. So when he gives his pressure of 3,000 pounds per square inch, he puts that in parentheses and gives 2 times 10 to the 7th newtons per square meter for the pressure. So as engineers, you must begin to read 
the literature on which we have newtons per square meter. This was, I know this doesn't get a ripple out of the audience today, but uh, five years ago, Kimball came over from England and talked to W.R. Grace Laboratory. And when I saw him, his manuscript with newtons per square meter in it, I proposed that I ask him that he delay mentioning the units of pressure. And I asked him the question as to what pressures were worked at. <clears throat> when he broke out with newtons per square meter, there was a general uproar. But I guess everybody's getting used to it. One thing that may not have been noticed, however, is a nice, neat way in which they give BET surface areas. Conventionally, we always speak of, 10 to the, of square meters per gram. But here they have to complicate it by making it 10 to the minus third times the square meters per kilogram. <laughs> I don't know if this is part of the international agreement or not, but it rather amused me. Uh, the activities here then can be given in unit area, and we particularly molybdenum sulfide is the most active of these. I don't think it means that molybdenum sulfide is a better catalyst for how to desulfurization in cobalt molybdate. Certainly per unit area, these two samples, this one with a rather small area, though I have, oh no, that's correct. I thought there was a period in there. Uh, this one with an area somewhat smaller than the cobalt molybdate has a very much higher activity per unit area. But anyhow, these are all the order of one or two except for this one, which is unusually high for molybdenum sulfide that's been heated to only 673 degrees. There's simply some typical data that Scheich and Gates give in their paper on hydrogen sulfurization. Next slide. One example that is given of a mechanism is this one for thiophene. Thiophene is pictured as tying into the molybdenum compound, breaking the double bond here, you see. And this particular compound then picking up an extra hydrogen here, switching over to one molybdenum, rotating with the attachment end of the sulfur down to the molybdenum, and finally coming out with a butadiene, or there's a butene product plus H2S. Now, to show you how transient mechanisms can be and how much guesswork there is to them, I want to cite at this point some recent work of Heinemann at the Mobile Company, the reference to which is given here and a statement is made. I don't have a slide covering his work. Heinemann took a cobalt moly hydrogen sulfurization catalyst, pre-sulfided it extensively with H2S to get it all to the sulfide, and then gave it a long treatment with deuterium. So there are no OH groups on the surface. There's nothing but OD groups on the surface. Then he hydro desulfurized thiophene using deuterium gas rather than hydrogen gas. Now, the normal thing that one would expect would be that the deuterium gas would interact with the sulfur of the thiophene, and one would get D2S or DHS. I think rather to his surprise, there was no deuterium in the H2S, in the sulfide form. There was no DHS, no D2S. For the first 16% of reaction, as circulation continued, and one got up to about 76% reaction, the fraction of deuteriums in the hydrogen sulfide went up to around 0.2, whereas at equilibrium it should be 0.9, statistically speaking. So all the way through the reaction of thiophene in its desulfurization act was not one in which the gas phase molecules come down and strip the sulfur off. In just plain language, it means that the thiophene de desulfurization behaves as though it splits out an H2S molecule on the surface of the cobalt moly catalyst. Then the gas phase comes along and cleans up what's, rest, what's left. If you start with thiophene, remembering this has a double bond here, steal these two hydrogens for the sulfur, you have left a four carbon proposition with two hydrogens on it. So obviously it's a very unsaturated material and will pick up deuterium or, or hydrogen, whatever is in the gas phase, quite readily to form butadiene or butene or maybe even butane. But this, this is an excellent illustration of two things. One, 
that most of the mechanisms that have been written for these reactions are just tentative mechanisms that seem plausible, but there's very little experimental proof of them. And the second thing I want to illustrate that I like to emphasize is the fact that tracer work may be very definitive in showing the way in which catalysts operate in some instances, and I think this is a particularly good example. I was a little disturbed at first today when I looked this over for the 10th time to make sure that all of the light hydrogens were taken off the surface. Uh, there are mechanisms proposed, you see, in which light hydrogens, in fact, there's one given by Short in his paper, in which light hydrogens present as OH groups get associated with the CH group next to the sulfur compound, and hence those hydrogens get transferred into the sulfur. But there's no light hydrogen on this catalyst. It was all carefully deuterated, so there were no OD groups at all, no OH groups, only OD groups. So this, at least, is one instance in which Presumably, the hydrogens come from the molecule that is being desulfurized. It also is apparent, I think, that if one puts a phenyl group on the side here, where there'd be no hydrogen, but tie this directly into the phenyl group, uh, there won't be a hydrogen available. And if you have a diphenyl group, such as we had in one of those early slides, there are no hydrogens available to the sulfur, so the hydrogen has to come from the gas phase. But for the central thiophene reaction, the hydrogen can and apparently does come internally from the molecule as an initial step in the reaction. I think it's also well to point out that in the thiophene hydrogenation, hydrodesulfurization, there's evidence that you do not hydrogenate the thiophene molecule before you pull the sulfur out. The sulfur pulls out first. It doesn't hydrogenate to begin with. Next slide. A mechanism of hydrodesulfurization in general proposed for the group at the Gulf Ordinary Laboratory uh, postulates the type of thing that you would normally expect, namely that there's a particular vacancy here on the surface, maybe a missing sulfur atom or something of the sort that you're going to be depositing sulfur in. So first of all, hydrogen becomes adsorbed, and some of it will be adsorbed next to this vacancy. Then the sulfur compound comes along and deposits sulfur in this vacancy, uh, from which point one can get a desorption of the hydrocarbon, and then finally a desorption of the H2S, uh, a desorption of the H2S as a result of hydrogen reacting with this sulfur that's been deposited. See, the little vacancy has now become a nodule of sulfur on here. Going back to the original material. Well, this is the mechanism that is ordinarily postulated to exist. And quite clearly, one from tracers could tell considerably about this mechanism, too, because if this is the mechanism that exists, then the sulfur in the surface is trading places with the sulfur from the gas phase so that the exchange between the sulfur here and the sulfur in the surface will be very much a function of the particular mechanism that's involved. In other words, you can imagine these molecules simply sitting down on top of the surface, have nothing to do with ever removing a sulfur and forming a vacancy like that. They can simply sit down by side by side and react for the hydrogen to pull off the sulfur. Or it can go through the removal of the sulfur from the lattice, uh, in which case the sulfur in the lattice, if one started, for example, with radioactive sulfur in the lattice, one would get rapid transfer of that into the final products. So by analyzing the products for radioactive sulfur that might be in the surface of the catalyst to begin with, one can tell quite a little bit about how the reaction may take place. I'm not suggesting any of that work be done down here necessarily because I know you're driving for more practical results. But uh, if a little time exists along the way, there's some very interesting things that can be done in the way of tracer work on these catalysts. Now, the problem with coal is not too dissimilar to the problem for the problem of oil residues. And I think I have two slides in here on oil residues. Next slide. This is one showing the patent literature on catalysts that are made for the purpose of desulfurizing residual hydrocarbons. In other words, the residues that the petroleum people talk about. 
And I wanted merely to call your attention to the fact that there's a general feeling that the asphaltines which are present in this resid, asphaltines such as quite well exist in the coal liquids too, tend to plug the pores of the catalyst. And there's a general feeling that one wants pores of a restricted size, such for example as something less than 70 angstroms here, where these asphaltines run up to about 100 angstroms in size. The idea being that the asphaltines will not plug these smaller pores. The other components in asphaltine can get into the pores and react, and this will sort of shield the catalyst from the asphaltines. On the other hand, there may be pores larger than 100 angstroms. You have to eventually do something with asphaltines because they contain sulfur also that has to be taken out. So you want a bimodal distribution of pores, one group smaller than 100 angstroms and the other group larger than 100 angstroms. Whether this is true, I'm not going to venture to say, but I just want to emphasize the poor distribution in the support that has gone into the patents that are typical and pertinent and related to the actual desulfurization of petroleum residues. Next slide. The other thing I want to emphasize, this is from a uh, talk that was given recently on oil residues, is the mineral content. Now in petroleum, the chief minerals are nickel and vanadium, in this particular case iron too, though iron is usually not so prominent. So that a big problem in oil residues, in the hydrodesulfurization of oil residues, is the poisoning of this expensive cobalt molecule catalyst by the accumulation of nickel and vanadium, which cover the catalyst up and change its characteristic activity and in fact ruin it. I believe that coal, as far as I recall the analyses, does not have large contents of nickel and vanadium. I think it has considerable titanium. But at any rate, the impurities from coal can gradually deposit on the catalyst unless indeed the velocity of hydrogen slurry passage in the synthol process and the ebullitory bed in the H process may be severe enough to knock some of these compounds off that would tend to accumulate and cake up on the catalyst. Uh, this brings to mind one other suggestion that was made by Heinemann when he gave his talk in Spain a year ago on the possibility of hydrodesulfurizing residual materials primarily. Uh, and that was a suggestion that the elimination of this nickel and vanadium poisoning proposition could be taken care of in a very clever way, namely by using a cleanup bed ahead of the catalyst. The uniqueness was the uniqueness of the cleanup bed. He was proposing to use manganese nodules. Maybe most of you have seen this. There's been a patent put up a mobile on it. Manganese nodules, you recall, are supposed to line the ocean beds and be available eventually whenever they settle the international details of who's going to mine what. Manganese nodules are hen's eggs type materials scattered over the ocean floor, quite high in manganese, quite porous, and apparently, according to him, capable of knocking out most of the nickel and the vanadium for a considerable period of time. And I don't know just exactly how long a ton of nodules would last, but the implication was that they would last for quite a little while. The expected cost is somewhere around three or four cents a pound. This may be optimistic, but this is what he was quoting compared to a dollar a pound or whatever it is for cobalt molly. So one could afford to replace the guard chamber a number of times to save the cobalt molly. Incidentally, the nodules also knocked out about half the sulfur from the residual oil. So that a guard bed in the case of residues is a very real possibility to safeguard the more expensive and more easily poisoned catalysts that are going to be used. Whether this will have any utility so far as coal is concerned, I won't venture to say but it's a thought to keep in mind. Now, there's been some theoretical work done on cobalt molly. This same paper by Short and Gates, I'm sure all of you in the coal business here have read it quite thoroughly. I'm equally sure that very few of you have read it well enough to understand it. I can put myself in the same category. He gives very detailed pictures as to the possible way in which cobalt may incorporate into the lattice of the gamma alumina and also possibilities of molybdenum incorporating into the lattice. So it's not just a case of cobalt moly sitting on top of the lattice, 
part of each of them may actually be incorporated into the surface layers of the alumina. Indeed, it's interesting that the one thing that is admitted by everybody is that for an effective catalyst, one needs something less than a monolayer of cobalt moly on the surface, or about a monolayer. In other words, the cobalt moly catalysts do not consist of large crystals of cobalt moly sitting on the catalyst. They consist of something in the order of a monolayer. Now, maybe some of you have noted and know whether or not any X-ray pictures ever show up cobalt or molybdenum, because they shouldn't if it's a monolayer. It just occurs to me that somebody may have taken some pictures of it and uh, know whether the cobalt moly or the cobalt sulfide, moly sulfide, do form any crystals. At any rate, the thing that is certain is that the amount of material there is equivalent to the formation of a monolayer. Whether it's all there as a monolayer, whether it might be as tiny, widely spaced crystallites, is a matter one can't say until he studies with x-rays. Uh, Wise and his co-workers did some work on conductivity and seemed to have some ideas in regard to the sulfur vacancies in the cobalt moly and catalytic activity. This is for thiophene dehydrodesulfurization. But the work is rather hard to read, and uh, I am not giving you a background anyhow of the relationship between conductivity and catalysis, so we'll skip that particular part of the subject. So this then summarizes, completes what I wanted to say in regard to hydrodesulfurization. Uh, I've only scratched the surface. I've indicated a few of the problems that are involved and that are encountered pointed out a few of the mechanisms that are proposed. And I think all one can say in conclusion is that this is a part of the whole catalytic system that needs a great deal of study. Uh, I think some of the intense study that I'm pretty sure is going to come out of this energy crisis period will enable us to be very much wiser in regard to the behavior and the operation of cobalt moly catalysts in five years from now than we are at the present time. Incidentally, regardless of how the money may be allocated that comes down here for work, or what the extent to which your work has to be relevant and to the point and so forth, uh, you'll be interested in knowing perhaps that the National Science Foundation had a workshop at Houston last June in which they expect to expend a million and a half dollars in basic work. And their question was, what do you suggest should be done in the way of basic research in this whole field of energy, including particularly the work on coal. And of course, out of that came a whole pour of, whole flood of suggestions, most of which involved doing basic research in the way of tracers, kinetics, and everything else you can think of on all of the catalysts concerned with coal technology in any way, including those used for carbon dioxide and hydrogen, which we talked about yesterday, namely for those for fissiotrope synthesis, methanol synthesis, methanation, water gas shift reaction, and even ammonia synthesis. So I anticipate that there's going to be a lot of very good basic work going on, regardless of how the other doles of money are turned out and how practical they may have to be in order to get the grants for proposed coal work. I want to turn now to the question of removing sulfur from flue gas. Uh, I have said nothing about the business of taking H2S out of gaseous components, such as you get from underground gasification, or such as you get from the uh, synthetic natural gas manufacturer. This is a very easy job and can be done without much difficulty. I've dwelt entirely on the taking it out of liquids. But uh, the alternative, if one gets tired of trying to take sulfur out of coal or fuel, the alternative, of course, is to take the sulfur dioxide out of the flue gas. Now, in this aforementioned Oak Ridge summary that was written out and that you have copies of relative to the problems faced by some particular power plant that wanted to get rid of sulfur, there is a nice collection of all of the projects that are existing in the United, that exist in the United States as of a year ago for removing sulfur from flue gases. If I recall correctly, I count them up. There are about 10 processes that are even designated as being commercial. This doesn't mean they've been applied to public utilities, but they've at least been applied, applied to 
smelters or some other exit through gas that had high sulfur content. Now, I've gone through a few of them, and in the notes here, you'll see a few of them, and I think I have a slide or two also if we look at the next slide. This is a slide given in that summary to illustrate the fact that there are about three, <clears throat> there are about three possible forms in which sulfur can be removed and retained with satisfactory results. One of them is sulfuric acid, one of them is calcium sulfite, and one of them is sulfur. Uh, of all of these, probably the sulfur is the most desirable because one can pile it up into beautiful yellow piles and let it sit there for a long time. I don't know what's eventually going to happen to the sulfur. I remember a year ago in Spain, one of the petroleum people from Europe calculated that by 1980, they should have accumulated 20 million tons of raw sulfur from desulfurizing the petroleum that they contemplate using during that period of time. This makes a sizable pile. I have a sneaking feeling that maybe ultimately they will start reversing the process for getting sulfur out of the ground, melting the sulfur and putting it back where it came from. But uh, I don't know. There's other work going on to try to use it in asphalt and mortar and all sorts of construction to use it any way they can. Uh, I was in Japan in 1969, and the one question that most scientists asked me was not anything in regard to catalysis, but what are we going to do with all of the sulfur we're going to take out of all of the petroleum that we're going to use in the next 20 years? And I guess this is still a problem. The second best probably is sulfuric acid, so that if SO2 can be the product gotten out of the sulfur removal in a highly concentrated form to form concentrated sulfuric acid, it is desirable. I think the dilute sulfuric acid is much less desirable. And finally, the calcium sulfide shown here is simply a waste product, and one has to have a place to dump this with no hope or prospect of using it again. I don't know whether there's a chance of this calcium sulfide eventually becoming a gypsum deposit or not, but uh, I think right now that wherever calcium sulfide is used, they simply find a place to dump it and don't pretend to use it. So those are the three ultimate forms in which sulfur is to be accumulated if it's removed from flue gas. Next slide. The one process that appears to be gaining most support, or at least is spoken of most favorably, is the use of magnesium oxide slurry to react with SO2 to form magnesium sulfide. This magnesium sulfide on heat on being heated, loses its water and leaves magnesium sulfide, which therefore gives a clean break to magnesium oxide and SO2. The SO2, therefore, can be formed in a very concentrated form and can result in concentrated sulfuric acid being obtained. The process apparently works without much difficulty. I forgot to bring that book in, but you have this book. I'm referring to this Oak Ridge National Laboratory volume on some power plant that was calculating the possibility of taking care of sulfur in different ways, and they go through the whole gamut of processes that we've talked about so far, including all of the sulfur removal processes. And I think there's some 25 or 30 different sulfur removal process processes that are described, of which, as I say, eight or 10 are classed as, quotes, unquote, quotes, commercial, unquote. Uh, it is my understanding that there is no power plant equipped as yet with a full scale process for removing SO2 from flue gas that has been even tested up to the present time. Small, small pilot plants have been run, and as I say, complete installations on some refineries, or rather smelters, uh, have been run, but I think none on utilities yet. But this is one of the more promising. Now, the others I didn't make a slide for, but if you turn the lights on at this point for a bit, I have them listed in the uh, notes here. Over on page four, probably an equally important and well-recognized process is the so-called Wellman-Lord process, which involves the interaction of SO2 with sodium sulfite, form sodium acid sulfite. This reverses itself on being heated to go back to the left and gives off 
SO2, but it also gives off water. So here one has the added job of condensing the water out of the SO2 before we use pure SO2. And this is a little less satisfactory, but I think there are statements made that this is the perhaps the most promising. It's between these two processes, I think, that the greatest promise lies so far as the taking SO2 out of the stack gases are concerned. Next, there's a good old catalytic oxidation process Monsanto has worked out. It's well known that SO2 will oxidize catalytically over vanadium or platinum to SO3. Now, one has to take into consideration that the partial pressures of SO2 are going to be down. The equilibrium for SO2 oxidation in a stoichiometric mixture of air, in other words, if you take the amount of air necessary to give the correct stoichiometry for converting SO2 to SO3, the conversions at 450 degrees, as I recall, are something in the order of 90% conversion of the SO2 to SO3. But clearly, the equilibrium constant is such that if you drop the SO2 down to uh, 1% or something of the sort, you drop the conversion quite considerably. And I know in the case of the automobile exhausts, where people are worrying about sulfuric acid formation in the exhaust from the platinum and the oxidation catalyst that you're finding in all of the nice new cars you're buying that have these oxidation catalysts, you know, and the mufflers, uh, they're worrying a little bit about whether droplets of sulfuric acid are going to appear. Because the sulfur in the fuel is going to be oxidized with the platinum and that catalyst to, sulfur, to SO3 and with the water present in the exhaust is going to come out as little droplets of sulfuric acid. The proponents of the use of these catalysts claim that the concentration of this would be small, and there you have the double effect of the oxygen partial pressure being small and the sulfur concentration being small, so the equilibrium conversion of SO2 to SO3 will not be anything like 90%, it'll be more like 10 or 15%. But even so, with the amount of automobiles used, there will be sulfuric acid droplets. Now, on the other hand, people who don't regard this as a serious point out that all of the SO2, whatever source, gets into SO3 and eventually into sulfates by photochemical oxidation. The difference is that one of them may be spit at you from an exhaust right at ground level, and the others will take time in the perhaps first mile or so of height to photooxidize over to SO3. So this is a problem that's going to be watched. And if you see ladies walking down the streets with holes in the nylon stockings, you may begin to suspect that there's some sulfuric acid coming out of the 75 cars. But uh, as I say, one will have dilute SO2. If one has dilute SO2, uh, the oxidation is not so favorable. But with these concentrated SO2s, one can get large conversions of sulfuric acid. One, oh, I was talking about the catalytic oxidation down here. Uh, with SO2 coming directly without any concentration procedure being carried out, the SO2 will be whatever it is, 1 or 2% in the stack gas. The oxygen is sort of limited in the exhaust gas, so unless you replenish the oxygen, there will be some depletion of the oxygen, some depletion of the SO2, and therefore this conversion will not be like a 90% conversion. It will be something less than that. So you might be able to get enough of it out, and of course if you recycle, stripping out the SO3 and then recycle the SO2, you can get more of it out. I don't know the working details of this process, so. I'm not prepared to say how completely they get the SO2 out. But unless they're very careful, they'll let part of the SO2 go through just for equilibrium considerations, which are difficult to beat. Uh, this was working for a while. I'm sorry I didn't bring in the summary of the experimental status of all of these, because it has a very nice summary as to whether they're now working or whether they're going to be working or whether the power plants are going to be built or whatnot. But, uh, it is looked on as a possible method and has been tried successfully on some of the smaller uh, metallic smelters and refiners. Now, I mentioned that calcium sulfite was used as one of the sources for disposing of the SO2. This comes about by simple wet scrubbing with limestone the SO2 forming of sulfur, sulfurous acid, which then forms calcium sulfite. Some of the calcium sulfite is converted into sulfate, but it doesn't matter if one is going to deposit the whole thing anyhow. And one usually in this mess would catch the fly ash in such a system also, and it would be mixed into the calcium sulfite. 
So this is another very favored process that has been proposed for taking sulfur out of flue gases. Another process is one proposed by the Bureau of Mines in which they have a citrate solution, a citrate thiosulfate solution, and it forms a, the SO2 forms a complex. The complex is released, well, the complex is actually reacted in their process with H2S. They get the H2S by steam and methane reacting as to form a reducing gas to reduce some of the SO2 to H2S. Then the H2S takes the sulfur out of this complex, converts it into elementary sulfur, which by a flotation process, so the oil comes up to the top and can be skimmed off. So this also has worked satisfactory in smelters. It's one that the Bureau of Mines thinks quite a bit of. I remember the comments in this ONRL summary were something to the effect that the, it uses a rather large amount of expensive chemicals. If you add the price of all of the citrate and thiosulfate up, it may be rather large. It depends on the efficiency with which the SO2 complex is broken up to give the original citrate thiosulfate material back for further work. Then there's some other processes I mentioned down here. One of them, this Cominco process, absorbing SO2 and ammonia to form ammonium acid sulfate and ammonium sulfite, then acidified to form ammonium sulfate and SO2. Uh, is one of the processes I recall as being called a commercial process. So to sum up, the prospects do not look too good for taking SO2 out of flue gas. Perhaps processes will work out in this procedure. I did notice this at a glance. I say nothing about the economics of anything here, but I happened to run across a page in the summary of the capital outlay for taking care of the SO2 from the flue gas in typical plants, and they range mostly in the range of 50 to 80 million dollars. Now this, as I understand it, is very much less than the outlay that one is going to have to have on a plant for taking the sulfur out of coal and producing uh, fuel oil or anything of this sort. I think the investment in those is going to be a lot higher. So as far as investment is concerned, it strikes me, uh, an inexperienced individual in this field and one who doesn't know particularly what he's talking about economically, that there might be less of an outlay for the SO2 flue gas business. Whether it would work well or not is a question yet to be decided. Now, in the remaining few minutes, I want to say just a few words about two things. One, about the methane business that I've talked to you about occasionally. You remember I mentioned the fact that the surface area of coal deposits is such as will accommodate all of the methane that is found in any mine so far as I know. I'm using average figures, and if someone comes up with an enormous figure that is two or three monolayers of methane on the surface area of the coal, I'd have to withdraw my statement. But everything I've seen so far leaves a big margin in indicating that somewhere between five and 10% of a monolayer of methane on the known surface area of coal is all that would be necessary to accommodate the methane that is observed and found in coal mines. Now. Maybe most of you are acquainted with the fact, but I was quite surprised that in the Pittsburgh area, there is an actual installation in which they drill down seven holes and then drill radio holes out from these for conducting out methane. And I think in the first transparency, I have a curve representing the behavior of this installation, seven drainage holes in the shaft. Initially, one obtained a million cubic feet a day of methane coming out. Gradually, after 40 days or so, this got down to the four or 500,000 range, and then it came back up and is running up today at around 700,000 or so cubic feet per day. The drop supposedly was due to water drainage getting into this mine. As you relieve the gas pressure, some water comes in and floods it and makes it more difficult for gas to come out. And as that water gradually gets removed by virtue of the partial pressure going on in the natural gas, I suppose, in the methane content, uh, the effect is relieved and this still keeps coming. 
Now, you may wonder how this methane can keep coming out of the coal. Well, first of all, there's a huge coal supply, and so I'm sure this is only a small fraction of the methane that is there. Secondly, one has to realize that the surface area I'm talking about is in capillaries and many coals that may be down to the order of five to six angstroms in size. And anybody knows, in fact, there are calculations, I don't have them with me here, but I've seen calculations, I have records of them, of the uh, Knudsen diffusion type equation that you have to use to calculate the diffusion through these tiny capillaries. And it would be a slow process for methane that's accumulated for years in these tiny cracks and crevices that are only five or six angstroms wide, and they may have to diffuse millimeters or even centimeters. It'll be a long time for this gas to diffuse out. So I have a hunch that this represents the slow diffusion of a large supply of methane from a large surface area of coal in this particular mine, and that this may be expected to go on for quite some time. At any rate, as of the date at which this article was written, which I think was about the end of 1973, in 287 days, as I recall, some 187 million cubic feet of methane have been accumulated. Now, I think I mentioned to you the other day that the total amount of methane associated with coal that is still on mine turns out to be somewhere between two and three trillion cubic feet. This is about comparable with the natural gas supply. So the taking of this methane, the using of this methane, is something that should supplement natural gas. It has the added advantage that if this is done to a mine before the miners go in to mine the coal, the chance of methane explosion is very much lessened because there will be much less methane in the coal that's being mined. So I thought this would be of interest to you in regard to the methane content. It's of interest to me because of the realization that coal has such a high surface area and can accommodate a gas of this sort. Uh, the last time that I want to mention briefly has to do with underground gasification of coal. I was reminded of this when I heard Ed Teller talk a little while ago. Believe it or not, Ed Teller is spending time going around and talking on the energy crisis, mostly on the utilization of coal. I believe Livermore has a project going on on underground gasification. I think that one of the initial steps in underground gasification has to be, as pointed out in here, the preparing of the mine for the underground operations. And this involves shattering the bed of coal in some way. I didn't, he didn't say anything about atom bomb explosions. I wonder if they had them in mind. But uh, from the work on natural gas, I think this has been inclined to leave a radioactive material of one kind or another behind so that it's probably not very desirable. But even any kind of an explosion can shatter a bed to the point at which one can begin to ignite the coal, burn it in place, force air or oxygen down, and thus get either a high grade or a low grade uh, synthetic fuel, which with methanation could go up to a high BTU or could be used as a regular low uh, BTU gas in the event that one uses air in the combustion process. Now I have two or three transparencies on very crude things. I don't pretend to understand all of them. I actually suggested that this is the one that be photographed with my good secretary took the entire page, and so it has another one up here that's much more complicated. It involves a number of holes being drilled down and a uh, system in which the combustion goes from one of these holes to the other, uh, gradually going across this borehole, and this is gradually burned out here somehow or other. I don't know the details of it, but a very simple picture of simply forcing gas, either air or oxygen, down into a chamber that has been into a hole that's been sunk down to the coal level. This, you see, would be used particularly for coal seams, maybe that are too deep to surface mine, too thin to build up a regular mine, so there would be a lot of coal that is in just the position and just suitable for this type of mining. Uh, the idea being then that one can force gas down, start a combustion going here, and gradually bring these gases of combustion out, uh, partially burn, if you want, put on steam in any desired amounts if one wishes, but even passing air through will give you a producer gas type material that can come out here and be utilized either on the spot to generate electricity or pipe certain distances. And admittedly, the question of 
the location of these mines is one of the difficult features because I think many of them are in the Midwest, quite some way from the place of which you want to use the power that's going to be generated. Next slide. This is another formulation in which two of these blowholes are illustrated with the gas passage going from one to the other and the combustion taking place between them. You can have a whole network of these you see in burnout pairs of them at a time. This gave an illustration of the way in which the contour of the coal is left when boreholes, when the burning from boreholes takes place across a sheet of material. Next slide. Now there are a lot of disadvantages to underground mining, burning of coal. Uh, one of them is the fact that you dig out or burn out coal, create a big vacancy, and you have to get cave-ins. The roof will fall in on you. So they've even proposed methods for taking care of that. The method being that with the air that comes in or the oxygen that comes in to burn the coal out, they also pass in a fill material. So when they get through, they've taken out and burned this coal out, but they fill it up with soil so that it eliminates largely the business of roof cave in because they replace the coal by a fill material as they burn the coal out, which I thought was a clever idea if it will work. There are other complications that arise. Water gets into the mine sometimes and floods them out and makes it about impossible to burn them. There's a leakage naturally possible. Got it. There's a leakage naturally possible so that gas that's generated can leak out cracks and crevices and so forth, contaminate the atmosphere and do all sorts of things. So there are many problems connected with underground gasification. But I judge from what I heard that Livermore is definitely pushing this project. I say in my notes in here that very little has been done and that things are more or less of a standstill. This was as of September 1973 that I was quoting one of the writers who was an authority in the field. Uh, incidentally, the history seems to indicate that Russia has done a good deal more in the underground gasification than we have. In fact, they've been operating it for a number of years in parts of in certain coal mines in Russia. So it looks as though activity is picking up. And this, as a supplementary type of, of uh, utilization of coal from mines that can't otherwise be worked very well, I think is a very promising thing. Now, in summary then, I think we've covered a few of the things related to the chemistry of coal and coal utilization, particularly the catalysis of coal. I've had to skimp and miss a few points. Some of them I missed because I didn't have room for them. Some of them I missed because I'm not an authority on coal and don't know everything that's going on. But uh, in any case, I hope that the material we've covered will be of some help in the program that's going on down here. Thank you. Are there any questions? We still have five or six minutes on the tape. Yes. I think the rule is to come up here because this contraption has to be used. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to mention that uh, concerning a cobalt uh, molybdate catalyst, uh, we have done some work uh, here. Uh, of a very preliminary nature, Dick Stralow uh, and I and Jerry Nyson from Treveca Nazarene College looked at cobalt molybdate catalysts using a photoelectron spectroscopy technique. And uh, your comment about uh, uh, some the, either the cobalt or the molybdenum being taken into the aluminum uh, alumina matrix, I think, is correct. Uh, we were able to find the molybdenum on the surface. And it looked as if we had a mixture of uh, molybdenum oxide with some other uh, species, uh, uh, possibly aluminum molybdate. The cobalt we were not able to find at all. Uh, we uh, were not able to find it that is on the surface. We were not able to find it on the surface of either the uh, commercial catalysts that we looked at or were we able to find uh, on uh, uh, some specimens that we prepared ourselves. This is after firing, of course. That's very interesting, and I'm glad that there's some such work going on. As a matter of fact, I think we have an appointment, so I'll get to see some of this work in the course of the next hour or so. I was delighted to know that attempts were being made to make these studies. The 
cobalt on the alumina, I think, was quoted by Scheidt as having been found by somebody. So maybe depending on the exact conditions, one can get cobalt incorporated into the surface also. In fact, I believe it's well known that for either nickel or cobalt on alumina, in certain temperature ranges, you're going to get cobalt aluminate and nickel aluminate. They do go into the gamma alumina if the temperature and conditions of operation are correct. Now, whether they go in in the technology or technique that's used in making a cobalt molly, I don't know. And apparently, in your case, they didn't go in. But uh, it's well to keep in mind that there is a possibility of getting actual cobalt aluminate from any cobalt oxide that gets onto the surface of alumina. Are there any other questions? I'm afraid this long walk up to the microscope discourages efforts, but uh, it's not very bad, and it's a nice place to walk. So if you have any questions, you get your name on this tape. It's coming up here in three, two or three minutes yet. Your question will be embedded in history if you ask one now. Because I understand these tapes are going to be used for people who are too busy to get here for the lectures, so they'll just be able to run a tape and get the whole lecture. The one sample that we looked at the other day indicated that all of the slides are perfectly readable. Fortunately, they leave me out of the picture when they take the slides, and I'm in the dark, you see. And uh, so the view isn't interrupted, and uh, they really have come out very well. And even the speaking voices all apparently are quite clear and reproducible. So I think this videotaping has been quite a success as far as I'm concerned. And uh, it's particularly something nice to have around. I understand Joel Hillebrand was here to give lectures for the last week or two. How nice it would have been to have taped his, because he's a 92-year-old specimen who's working just as actively and doing as good work as he ever did. The doctor finally made him stop skiing, I think, at the age of 84, much to his disgust. But otherwise, he's as lively as ever. And last December, my friend in, Portla in uh, Baltimore, Emmett Reed, whom some of you know, died at the age of 101. He was almost 102. And he had just finished his last book. So he was writing books, one of which I persuaded him to write, which he finished up on his 100th birthday and entitled My First 100 Years. <laughs> I don't know whether it's in your library, but it's a very interesting book. And the, one, the only thing I did was to make sure that nobody changed a word in it. It's all written in colloquial readism, whatever that is. And uh, his jokes and his puns are the ones that he was used to living with. If there are no more questions then or no more comments, I think this is a good place to sign off.